course. Uh, well, welcome everyone uh, for this uh, MA today uh, with uh, Stefan George from Gnosis, one of the founders, one of the CCO, uh, who has a fantastic history, a uh, fantastic uh, record of work in the space, which we're going to unpack. And we're so delighted to have you, Stefan, uh, for this event uh, today. Um, this is an MA, guys. So it's for you to ask the great things that you want to ask, um, or anything really, um, whether it's development related, whether it's um, entrepreneurship related, whether it's your project related, whether it's just about anything in the space, um, we want to hear it. Um, the structure is that uh, we'll take questions in turn. Uh, so please um, either raise your hand, as I've mentioned, by the reactions function, um, or indeed um, uh, use the chat and just type it in there and I'll kind of get to your question uh, throughout um, the, um, the, the session. Uh, I'm going to start the conversation, guys, with a few uh, questions of my own that uh, just kind of uh, kickstart things. Uh, and, and and go from there. Now, uh, for those who don't know, guys, uh, Encode, uh, hopefully a lot of you do know Encode because I see familiar faces, but Encode is a Web3 education community. We're here to provide fantastic programs to help you be trained to learn and get involved deeply in the crypto space and fulfill your, your personal and professional goals, uh, be it um, just contributing to the Web3 space, uh, building projects and startups, uh, or getting uh, a job in, in the space as well. If any of those things uh, mean something to you, uh, and you're not involved in code, uh, do uh, go to our website, www.encode.club, plenty of programs and opportunities. And we have a number of members of the Encode team with us here today, Vanessa, uh, Jake, I see Devon as well, uh, all of you here who, who are happy to answer your question. Uh, well, I think let's get things started. And I'm gonna get started with Stefan. It's great to have you. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Perfect. And thanks everyone for joining. Uh, awesome. Well, I'm going to start a nice, easy one uh, to get things going, uh, which is there's a very standard encode question, which is that will take you really all the way back, uh, which is when you were at university, uh, what did you actually want to do with your life? What did and how has that panned out relative to what you actually wanted to do? <laughs> yeah, actually, you can go even further back to uh, when I graduated <laughs> from high school, you know, like you have these... Uh, yeah, sort of like brochures where everyone writes down like what they want to do or like just comment yeah. on, on high school and so on. And I think there I already wrote like in the future, I would like to um, yeah, become an entrepreneur, uh, spe specifically working in the software engineering field. And um, yeah, I started developing quite early. I think I was maybe 16 or 15 or even earlier. I started developing software and so always like to do something creative and uh, I found that developing software allows me to be very creative like only your imagination and your own skills kind of the limitation and uh, yeah so I kind of still do exactly this like run a software company <laughs> and um, yeah so it's, it's of course like I did never imagine uh, to to work specifically in blockchain because at uh, that time when I graduated, Bitcoin didn't even exist yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, no, it has been very exciting. And so I can fortunately say I do exactly what I, what I wanted to do. Um, and yeah, so happy to push it forward. Fantastic. And, and Gnosis has obviously been on a quite incredible journey and a kind of highly successful journey. But it's a journey, it's taken on multiple iterations. I want to go right to the start, which is um, back in the consensus days. Um, so how did Gnosis get going? Uh, what was it like those early days? Uh, and uh, yeah, what, what do you remember most fondly? Oh yeah, so it goes even back further than Gnosis, actually. Like we, me and my uh, co-founder, we studied at the same university and uh, we, before we did anything blockchain related, we actually started already building sort of some ventures, uh, actually started with a poker bot <laughs> at the time when poker was very, very popular uh, and, and trained it such that it could play on like uh, small limits. Um, it was not super successful, to be honest. In the end, we had to stop working on it, but this is kind of the first thing we did together. Then we did some other ideas together, but none of them really ever took off. And um, yeah, I think then in 2013, um, Martin uh, like found out about the Bitcoin white paper and um, he saw big potential in it. And to be honest, after I read it, I, I thought it sounds a bit like a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> um, but obviously, we were still very early. <laughs> and so it was interesting to, to explore how we could uh, potentially leverage uh, Bitcoin. And so we started building software. 
um, which would allow to yeah to use Bitcoin. Um, we actually kind of created a prediction market using a Bitcoin as the currency, and um, of course with Bitcoin. Um, decentralization was very limited. Uh, the, the Bitcoin itself, transferring Bitcoin, this was decentralized, but the application was very centralized. And uh, so when we found about, out about Ethereum in 2014, we quickly realized that a lot of the logic, the application logic that previously was centralized, um, we could now try to decentralize. And so, yeah, we came up with the concept of how this could eventually be done. And... Um, yeah, at that time, we also met Joe, uh, who just recently uh, founded Consensus. At uh, this time, it was a very small company. It was uh, maybe like two employees or so. <laughs> and then uh, me and Martin joined as employee number three and four. So it was really at the very, very early wow. stage. And uh, he gave us, I would say, the opportunity to, to work on what we wanted to. Uh, of course, he also gave us the salary. So we, we were just... I had, uh, I think I had just had graduated from, from university. So it was kind of, and I had just had taken the gap year actually. So I kind of graduated, then I took a gap year and then I just came back on Christmas Eve <laughs> to my hometown. And then basically January 1st, we started working in consensus. <laughs> so it was <laughs> a very quick decision. Um, and yeah, we, we, we wanted to build prediction markets, decentralized prediction markets. And consensus gave us uh, the room to experiment uh, with this idea as much as we wanted to. And, um, and yeah, this time uh, it was very early, obviously, like it was before Ethereum launched. So um, you can think of like the entire like development environment. There was no truffle. There was no hard hat. There was nothing. You had to build everything yourself. Uh, and uh, Solidity was changing every week. So every, every week you had to change your smart contracts to even be able to compile them uh, according to the latest version. And um, yeah, and actually I was working out of Berlin, uh, out of the Ethereum dev office. So Ethereum had actually, I think at that time, only one real office, uh, which was based in Berlin. And so I had the um, pleasure to work directly together with the, with the, with the uh, like creator of Solidity. Uh, Christian Reitwiesner, who, who was sitting next to me. And so I think it was mutually beneficial that on the one hand, you have obviously the person who develops the language and then me giving direct feedback in terms of how we're using this language. And um, yeah, this was, of course, a great opportunity for us and uh, mutually beneficial. And uh, yeah, but it was, it was crazy. Everything was changing. Uh, honestly, I was so close to it that I sometimes was also questioning uh, the potential of Ethereum, you know, like, like sometimes you have the effect that you are very close to something and so you see all the flaws <laughs> and so it makes you really question if this was going to take off. Um, but of course, independent of all the struggles that we faced, uh, we continued and um, also bootstrapped some early ideas, kind of like we created something called Test RPC, which was a simulation environment uh, that essentially later turned into Ganache as part of Truffle. And I think those kind of basic infrastructure was just not there at the very beginning. And so you had to do everything yourself, which uh, on the one hand is exciting because uh, well, you work on so many different problems. On the other hand, of course, it slows you down quite a bit. And I think that's still true today that um, we are still early and a lot of infrastructure still has to be built. And so I feel people that come a bit later to, to the same game, uh, they have the huge benefit of not having to figure out everything. Uh, but they can benefit hugely from the infrastructure that has been built over the last couple of years. And, uh, but I think that's also great because uh, yeah, we, like, we have there's the possibility to, to create competition with every new wave of developers <laughs> because they can easily uh, piggyback on all the work that has been done in the past. And um, yeah, it was very exciting, it's still very exciting, <laughs> even after so many years. Um, but yeah, I think the, the first... I would say, especially before the launch of Ethereum, uh, like just developing on Ethereum ha was a big pain. Uh, I guess maybe similar to how it is now if you want to work, for example, on Solana, uh, you have to figure out a lot of things. Uh, so yeah, but I guess it's the early days of every, every kind of developer environment is just uh, yeah, its own challenge. Yeah, I mean, there's so many places I want to go after that. Uh, first <laughs> of all, that's fascinating. And I think it also was a really good summary of how 
how linked to the history of Ethereum Gnosis has been, and you guys as founders have been, that it's almost, and obviously consensus's role in that is also so important, but it really goes back to the, the really earliest rumblings of what we now consider a massive ecosystem with so many people. And Gnosis were always right there at the start, and you guys were. Um, to unpack a bit, bit about consensus, you said you were, you were such early employees, and obviously, like, that's kind of weird to be like early employees, but you guys go off into your own sandbox and build this like thing that will become successful rather than like, I know consensus probably always not struggled, but it, the, the exact vision of consensus wasn't always clear from where to go. But what was that like? Like that is a big bet to be like, let's take two fantastic devs, you guys go and build something else, not build this core thing. How did that come about? Right, right. Yeah, it was indeed quite crazy how consensus developed. Honestly, yeah. when I first heard about Joe and Joe offered us this uh, opportunity, I wasn't sure if Joe would be able to pay us because just I didn't he know would, him. Yeah. I didn't know that he is this like yeah he, he is this big investor, and so yeah, um, we had uh, like Martin was at the time in New York, and so yeah. he invited Joe over uh, for dinner, and then we all met for the first time in person. And then we showed him a demo of what we have been building on. And this definitely helped a lot also to just establish the, the trust between us um, yeah. to have this uh, like real life experience as well. Previously, it was just a Zoom call. <laughs> and at the time, it seemed kind of a bit, uh, yeah, I don't know. Of course, it's not the same as meeting someone in person. And um, yeah, I think Joe always had this uh, philosophy of giving people as much freedom as they want to. Uh, and they will figure it out eventually. And I think this went very well at the very beginning, especially. So he, he basically gave everyone who wanted to work in the space the opportunity to work in the space, um, providing the funding, uh, everything that you yeah, would need to not have, let's say, opportunity costs uh, of working at Google or somewhere else. And uh, I think this was super, super crucial. So a lot of the early projects like MetaMask and so on, they, all of them benefited hugely from having this uh, person that is able to invest a lot into building the ecosystem, giving everyone the freedom to do what they want to do. And um, this worked very well at the very beginning because lots of people were interested. And I think especially the people that were interested very early on were kind of also very qualified because they're like, I would say, being interested in this topic was a natural filter for talent. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I think it worked super well. Of course, as, as the company grows, it becomes much more a challenge. And I think um, giving everyone the freedom to do whatever they want doesn't scale necessarily. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the issue that consensus was facing. I mean, for a long time, it went super well. <laughs> and uh, even though I was always kind of a little bit critical about this idea of, um, that's have, having this mesh, having this uh, this different style of working. It worked super well for a very long time until I guess it got just too big and too messy and people started exploiting having this freedom. And I think then, of course, consensus had to, um, yeah, had to face some consequences and they had to size down. Uh, but I think right now consensus is a very, very good state um, and 100%. has very successful products. And I think people, always underestimate how much uh, consensus was actually giving into the space to actually even Jeez. get to a point where it Jeez. could work. Yeah. Uh, especially, I think, at the time when the Ethereum Foundation was struggling. I mean, for a long time, Ether was trading at a value where, yeah, I think it did not reflect the potential success. So for yeah. a long time, we were trading below a dollar at one dollar. And uh, the Ethereum Foundation was a bit struggling at the time to even, for example, organized DEFCON 1 in London. Yeah. And um, yeah, Joe stepped in and made sure that this is possible. Um, yeah, regarding Gnosis, uh, I think just because we were always working remotely, uh, I mean, I was based in Berlin, Martin was based in New York, but he was still mostly working remotely. Uh, we always had, I would say, a different yeah, relationship to consensus. So it was more like, um, more like, I would say, like an incubation uh, like they gave us everything we needed, but we were still had a high degree of independence. And uh, yeah, like the first ICO that ever took place on Ethereum, obviously was the Orga ICO, uh, which was insanely successful. Like by today's standards, it's kind of insane. They raised, I think, over 5% of the Ether supply at the time. And uh, I think an equal amount in Bitcoin. 
<laughs> so it was really completely insane. And of course, us building a competitor to Augur, we were also at that point and considering, yeah, we should probably also do an ICO. And um, yeah, I think then we, we started planning for this event. It took quite some time. I think given that we were part of consensus, we wanted to make sure, of course, that also from a legal standpoint, it's, um, yeah, it has a very, very solid foundation. And yeah, this took a bit of time. But then after two years, we were able to successfully do the ICO and uh, yeah, become fully independent from consensus. And um, yeah, I guess we also had fortunate timing. <laughs> Yeah. Ether exploded right after the token sale. Uh, so we raised, I think, $12.5 million in our ICO at the time when Ether was $50. And um, we were, of course, very long Ether uh, anyways. Like we were believing in the future that we were building. And we saw also either Gnosis becomes a success, then it heavily depends on the success of Ethereum, uh, or both fail, but then it's also fine. <laughs> and so us keeping huge ether exposure was obvious. So we did not sell anything. And that brought us into a very interesting position where suddenly we had a tremendous amount of money. Um, we also had fortunate timing in kind of selling. Obviously, there was this huge bubble in 2018. And when it got really too crazy, um, we also decided to simply sell ether. <laughs> and we sold enough. So we could invest a lot also through the long lasting bear market, which was of course a very fortunate position to be in. And uh, yeah, and now we are here <laughs> and uh, have pivoted quite a bit, but I guess I, I, I wait for new questions before I- I was gonna uh, say, so two, I'm gonna ask one more. It's a totally good thing. Yeah. Uh, second, uh, guys, please put your hands up if you wanna ask face-to-face -face questions. For some questions, please go ahead, put them into the chat and we'll get to them. Uh, but hands up if you want to ask face to face. I, I have one question before I hand over to other people, which is you've obviously, maybe this is you as a person, but you seem very relaxed in the space now. Like in when everyone else is frantic, your approach seems very relaxed and very sure of your place, which probably comes from seeing the whole span of what Ethereum has gone through and obviously the bear and more than one bear. Um, what is your state of mind towards the whole space now? Is it this kind of like, you know, it's going to be big, you know, things are going to happen, you've seen it all before, or do you still have that anxiety that kind of, do you, do you detach yourself now from what's going on with the week by week, the day by day, because it's all, it's all small history? How, how, how have you cultivated that mindset? Or is this just you as a person, just right. cool, calm and collected? Yeah, I guess being relaxed is just my personality. <laughs> it's a hard Good to, way to like, <laughs> But uh, of course, there's so much happening and there's this kind of constant FOMO in the space. Uh, and, um, but of course, like given how long we are in the space and how long we are operating, I, yeah, we always think long-term. We always had the benefit of having the funds to think long-term. So that's why even the bear market, like it was not a concern for us at all, fortunately, as we kind of cashed out before the bear market, we never had to worry. We could grow and just uh, do whatever we want through the bear market. I would say the biggest downside of the bear market for me personally was it is much, much harder to develop a product in the bear market simply because there's, yeah, there's a lot less attention. And if you want to build good products, you need a lot of users. And this was just not really the case through the bear market. And I think that's now a lot more interesting. And also, I would say the biggest challenge in the bear market, finance was not an issue at all, but um, if you have a big team, keep the team motivated uh, that this is actually going to work, uh, where it's not really 100% in your own, um, let's say, responsibility uh, or even possibility to, obviously, we cannot end the bear market. Gnosis cannot end the bear market, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but of course, everyone kind of depends on this event to happen. And so I was always uh, saying to everyone, yeah, we work hard now, so we are ready for the time when the bear market ends and we have a product ready that can capture the value that's being created. And um, yeah, I mean, fortunately we now made it and we were, I think, ready uh, at the time when the bear market ended. Uh, but I would say this was from psychological perspective and from a leadership perspective, uh, the biggest struggle to face. And I, I guess this is the same for all the big companies that were going through the bear market. Awesome. 
Uh, right, again, so much to unpack, but let's hand over to some questions. So first of all, the question was, I mean, apart from the obvious financial advice, what is one thing you'd wish you'd knew, you'd known five years ago? Yeah, good question. Um, I think we should always, um, I, I think a mistake that we did, we neglected great ideas too early. <laughs> so we have tons of ideas, um, but we didn't necessarily evaluate some of them enough and we discarded some of them uh, too early. Others we kept on for too long. So to give an example, um, one of our engineers, he came up with the idea of the constant product formula, um, which is famously the basis of Uniswap uh, and obviously is a huge success. And yeah, we had the, fir were the first team to actually uh, invent this. And um, we, we didn't see the potential in it <laughs> because we saw so many potential flaws in the mechanism. So for example, Uniswap is prone to front running, right? Like MEV. Uh, which at the time when we invented it, we saw the potential issue of MEV. The term obviously didn't exist. And because we saw so many issues and we saw a banker doing something similar and was not really our core business, we were thinking like, ah, let's just discard this. And um, we just put it on GitHub. It's still there. Like you can still go to the GitHub repository of 2017, where you basically find the code that in the end became Uniswap. Uh, obviously, there's a big step from an idea and the prototype to real product. And I would not claim that you would have, have the same success as Uniswap, but I think that just showed like we discarded some ideas too early. Uh, on the other hand, some ideas we were pushing on for too long. And I think this is the case for actually what we started with is prediction markets. Um, we had many, many different iterations. We, we tried for a very long time to apply for a license. It took us, I think, uh, almost five years before we decided to just stop doing this. And this was too late. Uh, I think we should have, if you set yourself a goal and you should also set yourself like a timeline to accomplish it and really start questioning yourself, if you don't make it in time. Because at some point it's wasted resources, team gets burned out. And uh, I think it's something that we did not consider enough. Uh, I think it was, of course, we started and we collected money for prediction market. And so we felt very, committed and obliged to deliver this, um, but we delivered multiple versions, Not, none of them really worked. And also all our competitors failed in, I would say, getting traction. So I think we should have stopped uh, earlier. And uh, yeah, some team members unfortunately left also because they, I think they got burned out and this could have been prevented if we would have stopped earlier. Very good. Uh, right, let's take some face-to-face -face questions. Oren, uh, over to you, sir. Hello, Stefan. My name is Oren. Nice to meet you. Huge fan of your work. Um, I kind of had a question about kind of the governance. Uh, I operate my business in America. And as you know, it comes with its own like legal and financial obligations. Wyoming recently recognized DAOs as legal entities based on the decentralized nature of how they govern themselves. Was there a reason that Gnosis created a DAO over a foundation? And could you kind of explain more about the DAO and how it helps Gnosis to operate? And is there a distinction between yourself and your influence over the company and the way that the DAO governs the overall protocol? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, thank you, Aura. Very, very good question. So Nose started actually as a for-profit company. So we were really like raising money, not into foundation, but we in a for-profit <coughs> company in Gibraltar. And the reason why we went to Gibraltar was because they created a legal framework, um, like a DLT framework, where we saw the potential to actually run also prediction markets. In the end, it turned out we couldn't, <laughs> but we at that time we thought that is actually where we want to go. And um, yeah, recently we changed. We we are now in the process of changing uh, the limited into a foundation. Uh, and the reason is that um, yeah, we don't see ourselves as really the shareholder of those funds. Like we, those are obviously owned by GNO token holders. And uh, it was more the nature of how everything started that it started as a for profit company, but we really don't see ourselves. <laughs> being this. And that's why we are in the process of turning it into foundation. And we also started transferring funds from the foundation into Gnosis DAO. And Gnosis DAO is in fact uh, like um, yeah, a fully decentralized DAO 
uh, doesn't have a legal wrapper actually. It's like MakerDAO doesn't have a legal wrapper. And um, yeah, the nature has very much changed, of course. And it's much, much more interesting for me personally. Uh, obviously, like if you are in a company and you, you have board meetings, but you are, you're not really, um, I would say on the one hand, you don't, have, you don't feel the responsibility necessarily towards, uh, towards um, investors or like we feel it, but it's, we don't get the feedback. Maybe that's a better way to phrase it. Like we don't get the immediate feedback on what our plans are because there's not an obvious channel how we should share and communicate all the plans, decisions we would like to make. Because obviously in the closed company, that's a board decision. Um, and so I think since we started um, making those decisions within the DAO, we receive a lot more interest. Um, we have actually a lot new uh, also token holders uh, who will give us really valuable feedback. <laughs> and um, yeah, now like we have a very active DAO, like on a daily basis, um, yeah, token holders are posting proposals, comment on proposals and give us really valuable feedback and uh, definitely has a very, very big impact on how Gnosis is moving forward. Uh, of course, right now, still many things are incubated within Gnosis uh, or like by teams that have been created by Gnosis, uh, but I can already see that, um, yeah, this becomes a lot more decentralized and uh, I am very, very happy that we decided to make the direction to make the step into the direction of uh, yeah becoming a full DAO uh, simply because um, community is obviously super important in crypto, <laughs> and I think for a long time Gnosis didn't really have a community. <laughs> like we had some technical products, and um, I think Gnosis was always recognized for having good developers and so on, but we never had really a strong community. I think this is now changing because token holders feel they have the influence and they can really shape how Gnosis is going forward. And um, yeah, I think the first very big decision that Gino token holders had to make was just recently uh, the decision to merge uh, with another project, XDAI. And uh, that was of course, yeah, a very exciting uh, proposal which was effectively done as a DAO proposal. So everything that was related to this merger was 100% transparent. Uh, and was really executed from the Gnosis DAO safe. So the tokens, like the token merge and uh, offering the swap contract, all of this was actually like an on-chain DAO proposal, which I think is yeah, very exciting. Thank you so much. Great, great question. Uh, thank you very much. Right, let's go Rogelio. I've said that so wrong. I, as I said, I was like, I've said this wrong. <laughs> Hi, Stefan. Uh, <laughs> well, now that I already mentioned about DAOs, um, could you explain me what is the the different uh, jurisdiction that DAOs are preferred by crypto? I know that Panama is one of the preferred places, but I haven't found a, a Panamanian lawyer that can explain it to me why it's good to have a DAO in, in Panama. Yeah, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a lawyer. Um, of course, we looked into multiple jurisdictions. Uh, I think Oren previously mentioned the one in US. Um, at this point, I think it's a very tricky question. And I think probably it's a question that's easier to answer in hindsight in a few years, like which jurisdiction actually makes the most sense. Um, I'm always a bit concerned about using jurisdictions which are kind of obviously just a way trying to kind of to circumvent <laughs> things. Like uh, Panama, to me, it sounds a bit like this. Uh, same maybe for the Cayman Islands. And um, what my view on this is that uh, DAOs will become much, much bigger than they are today. Um, and uh, very soon, I think most uh, countries will face the issue on understanding of how they want to deal with DAOs and how they should recognize DAOs. And uh, so I think this will be a much, much bigger effort um, which will happen in the next couple of years, simply because uh, I could definitely see that some DAOs will become <coughs> uh, as large as the largest corporations uh, on this planet. And so it's pretty obvious to me that, yeah, these questions will come up. And it's pretty clear to me that if, if it's registered in the Cayman Islands, that will not be uh, sufficient. Um, but again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't feel really comfortable of giving here clear advice. Uh, 
again, like I think it's uh, something where in hindsight we will know better. I, I think there's also a good case to make for for DAOs that don't have uh, any legal wrapper, like make a DAO. Um, ultimately, I, for me, it's very difficult to understand where the value creation actually is, especially in our field. It's pretty clear it's not in Panama, it's not in Cayman Islands, somewhere else. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess this question will have to be answered in the next couple of years. And um, I'm also sure that uh, given, given the global nature of DAOs that, um, yeah, I think we will find ways to, we should approach regulators, we should talk to them about this and we will find ways to deal with this situation and make sure that value created by DAOs is also, of course, uh, yeah, accounted to, to places where the value creation actually happens. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Uh, Vanessa, over to you. Oh. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. Stefan, uh, thank you for sharing your experience. You kind of make me remember the origins of the, my contact with blockchain. Actually, I, uh, you, you told some words that it triggered my mind. So I had my first contact with blockchain 12 years, 12 years ago. <laughs> I was one of the first adopters, early adopter, and the first thing that comes in my mind at that time it was, you know, uh, yeah, it comes up picture with some some game game like meaning, you know, like when I installed my first blockchain software at that time. So, in my question uh, to you is 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 about this context uh, with games and uh, in DAOs. So, uh, I, we have been developing a game, but we. We kind of decide we are testing another market connected with tickets and uh, some kind of uh, con connected people in events and kind of that. So I want to ask to you, how do you, any thoughts about the, you know, uh, in DAO, DAO ecosystem, there is many things to, to solve, but how do you see how gamification process can interact with this human process to intake decision and you know like kind of <clears throat> yes kind of try to solve the problem bes uh, beside the people first you know like because people is, is we are really good to make problems you know like to, to, to mess things and if you kind of play with behaviors and those kind of gamification you can kind of you know like i have some intuition about that uh we are like to to, to just to be clear we are applying events here, kind of uh, profiling, you know, and those stuffs. But yeah, my question is, what do you think about those kind of market DAOs and games to, you know, to, to kind of show some ways to help them take decisions? I hope that my question makes some sense. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. No, totally <laughs> makes sense to me. Um, there's an obvious problem that uh, every DAO is currently facing, which is, uh, voter apathy so people are not really participating um, they don't see a value in participating most token holders hold tokens because they speculate on the value of the token but they don't really expect they have to do anything for it um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah i think there's definitely like a like a an issue there where i think gamification could be could be one way to solve it or like just get more engagement in DAOs in general um, we've been also actually playing around with this idea um, of using prediction markets for governance. So obviously there's this uh, one concept called futaki in prediction markets, which effectively is applying prediction markets to make decisions. Uh, to give an example, um, we could have a prediction market on if we should fire a CEO. <laughs> and the way how the prediction market would work is the prediction market would predict, uh, let's say for example, the stock value um, of the company at the end of the year, uh, depending on if the CEO was fired or not. <laughs> and then you can let this market run for a while. And uh, let's say for two months, and if after two months on average, like the market predicted, the stock value will actually go up. <laughs> if the CEO is not there, then yes, he will be fired. Um, this is just like one way uh, how I think we, we could uh, kind of add this game of predicting uh, into governance and also add a financial benefit to those who are like participating because obviously when you predict the correct outcome you earn a profit um and uh so yeah i think there's definitely many ways we could we should we have to think about 
uh, how we can get more people engaged in governance and yeah games is definitely like if we see prediction markets as sort of a game which i think many people do yeah. uh, then that would be one way um, but there are probably also others uh, i guess also depends of course a bit on what the dao is about like how serious is this dao is this a dao which in itself is maybe for a game then i guess uh, it will be more easy to embed this if it's about let's say big financial decisions and i guess the game itself also will also be more serious um, but really, I think it really depends on the context of what the DAO should govern. Awesome. Great question. Over to, to Mayor. So uh, as you were saying that um, the, for DAOs, it really kind of resonates to four foundations. So for <coughs> the four foundations of the DAO, should it resonate with uh, a foundation? Like uh, while you're building a DAO, will it be a foundation first or a profitability first? Because it's as it's a community first service and kind of service for the organizations like for the DAO itself so should it, uh, at first work as a foundation then work towards for the next step as a for, for profit of organization yeah in my view is like if you are creating a new DAO and you expect uh, or you need you see this a functionality where um, like you need a foundation so for, maybe to give an example a concrete example like the notice save is becoming independent of Gnosis. And now they're creating both. They create a foundation and a DAO. And uh, with the safe, for example, we have IP rights, like the branding, um, like different accounts, uh, which will be in the future owned by the foundation. <laughs> because a DAO, a DAO without legal wrapper cannot own any of those, obviously. So there will be the foundation, which will take care of those parts. And then you have the DAO which will uh, effectively control the safe tokens and where token holders can vote of how tokens should be, uh, should be allocated. Um, I think a for-profit company, um, I would say are mostly probably companies that work for the DAO, like for example, a team that will create something or yeah, service companies. Um, I don't see like why you should have like a for-profit company that will kind of match the, the DAO itself. Uh, for me, that goes a bit against uh, the nature, I think, of the, of the DAO itself. Of course, the DAO itself can generate revenue. <laughs> you can think about how it can be redistributed to token holders, but this will probably not go over, uh, over the uh, for-profit company. So one example is Maker, right? Like there is still a DAI foundation. I mean, they dissolved like the main Maker foundation um, because they wanted a big uh, explicitly get rid of this old structure. They still have a Dai Foundation, which I think will, uh, yeah, will do efforts and lobbying and uh, promoting promoting Dai. Um, but everything else is really uh, like a DAO without any any uh, legal wrapper. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't have revenue. Of course, the DAO has revenue from stability fees and so on and liquidations. And it's giving this value also back to token holders by buying back MKR token and and burning them. Um, and then there are for-profit companies, like all these small like core units, which are working around MakerDAO. They are, I think, all for-profit and they, they just work uh, in service contracts, uh, I think, for MakerDAO. If that makes sense, hope this yeah. answers the question. It was more elaborate. So, yeah, thank you. More elaborate. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, George, over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I listened to you while we were talking earlier. Um, you mentioned you were, you were there when uh, the creators of Solidity were just building it when Ethereum was just starting and all that. And I think it's safe to say that you've seen it all. So my question is uh, a very generalized one. And um, I, I want to ask you, from the trend you've seen since the beginning up until where we find ourselves today in the <clears throat> ecosystem, what do you consider the factors that makes a project successful and another fail, a failure? Uh, not as a, we know that there are no two startups that are the same. The circumstances are different. The teams are different and all that. But generally speaking, <coughs> one, two, three, what do you think uh, makes a project successful? You yourself, you are a co-founder of a successful project. What do you think could be uh, that... Uh, uh, intending startups could look out for maybe just to uh, increase their chances of 
at success and probably to avoid failure? Yeah, very good question. Um, for me, it's definitely different. Uh, there's a big difference between Ethereum as a product and let's say like an application building on top of Ethereum. So if I would have to say like, why did Ethereum become a success? Um, I think the reason why Ethereum became a success is because uh, like the values and culture and the idea obviously that was promoted, especially at the beginning uh, of Ethereum resonated very well um, with people that also simply had the skill and the commitment to make this work. They really saw the potential uh, to change the world and, um, and were yeah, super highly committed uh, despite all the struggles that also the Ethereum Foundation went through. Um, was able to, yeah, to always keep like a core of people that was able to make progress. And I think this especially worked very well at the very beginning, uh, especially before Ethereum went live, uh, made a lot of progress in a very short time. Um, obviously, like the kind of the, the more Ethereum grew, uh, the more centralized it got, it also became a bit more difficult to do larger changes. And I think Right, right at this point, Ethereum is kind of almost at a late stage of, of a product where it um, has very clear product market fit. Um, and it's, uh, it's a bit difficult right now to do bigger changes. Obviously, proof of stake is still coming. But uh, beyond this, uh, I think ambitions uh, of, of core developers and the Ethereum community to do large changes on Ethereum is limited. Um, but yeah, I think for me, the reason why Ethereum succeeded is a very strong vision, um, also very, uh, yeah, I think Vitalik is definitely a leader who also um, promotes the values quite well. Uh, and yeah, and I think everyone who was part of the core team was very committed to this. And ultimately, those were maybe like 30 people. <laughs> uh, but in this case, this, this was enough to, to get Ethereum off the ground. And um, yeah, and I think then it was all about... Uh, growing the ecosystem and getting more and more people committed. Something that was also specific about Ethereum that really uh, got me interested in, or like let me see the potential was that there were lots of different meetups, uh, meetup groups created very early on globally, uh, something that you did not see before. So uh, it was kind of like everyone was kind of waiting for this idea apparently. And then people jumped on the train and understood, okay, we want to learn more. We see the potential. And um, yeah, I think this kind of community building early on, having like a super strong core team that's super aligned in division, um, this helped a lot to get Ethereum off the ground. And I think then very quickly, um, it actually also decentralized uh, quite well. So we mentioned that Ethereum Foundation was struggling, right, at the beginning, also financially, but then you had already like Joe Lubin who was able to step in and made sure that uh, this, this phase, this struggling phase, um, was not like causing too much damage to Ethereum. And uh, yeah, and I think from there on, just more and more people saw the potential, bought into the platform and also made themselves um, committed to it. And uh, this is also obviously true for Gnosis. Like we, I think the fact that all the ICOs mostly raised Ether made them obviously also very much invested into the success of the platform itself. So I think it was very interesting incentive alignment. And for us Gnosis, We've been doing a lot of like work, which usually would, yeah, which is effectively providing public goods. So we also took over, for example, maintaining one of the main clients of Ethereum for a while. And we did not do this uh, to make money. Uh, we did do this because uh, we are also large uh, Ether holders and we feel committed to the success of Ethereum. And uh, yeah, I think that that was the reason why Ethereum succeeded. And it's very difficult to replicate culture. That's always underestimated, but I mean, I don't want to speak badly about Binance Smart Chain, but uh, Binance Smart Chain is definitely struggling right now uh, simply because it has not promoted the same culture as Ethereum. It's like copycats of, of applications that run on Ethereum. And for some time, you can, of course, like make people really excited about it, about it with just uh, throwing money at it. Um, but that's not really sustainable. And ultimately, I think culture is really what gets people attracted, like sharing the same values. And um, yeah, that's not easy. In terms of 
very shortly speaking about applications on top. Um, of course, you also have to build a great culture in, in your team and your community, but more important is of course, finding product market fit and be able to get to this uh, quickly or like focus on it. I think in, at Gnosis, we kind of struggled with this a bit um, because we, even though we raised 12.5 million, we suddenly <laughs> had a lot more resources <laughs> available and uh, we sort of almost became like a, like, yeah, a fund manager effectively. And um, yeah, we started developing all kinds of things, which kind of made us lose a little bit focus. Um, but recently, uh, yeah, obviously we, we kind of focus now on, on also safe and cow swap and more recently on, on also change. You can still say like we do many things, but that's why it's also why we decided to uh, make cow swap and safe independent um, because then they can focus again better on what they, what they want to accomplish. And our focus will shift now towards Gnosis chain. So yeah, product finding focus. Focus is the number one thing every founder has to has to do, like making sure you really focus on the one thing where you can prove product market fit, and then uh, everything else uh, will find itself. <laughs> Thanks, George. Let's take some questions from the chat. What do we like? Uh, yeah, I mean, we kind of touched on this: how you build multiple successful products. I mean, just kind of. On a built team building perspective and a scaling perspective, how did you do that? I mean, building one product hard, two, three, four, <laughs> kind of like very hard. How did you manage that from a hiring? And then specifically, just the managerial perspective, was it kind of heads of each project and trust them? or And what were the failures? Were there any ones we haven't seen that were like, the process failed, they never saw the light of day, but they had a lot of your headspace in them? Right, yeah. Team building is super tough, especially right now, it's super competitive. Um, I think one of the reasons why we succeeded, especially also uh, with engineering, is because we were able to source from a big uh, group of people that we had personal connections with. Um, so I'm a computer scientist, uh, my co-founder is a computer scientist, and so we were able to, um, yeah, to hire people uh, from the university where we studied and uh, hire the best <laughs> and this helped a lot um, to also then of course hire the next round of developers so um, like people say like a people hire a people and b people hire maybe c people <laughs> and this is true like uh, i think in order to create a very good team um, it is worthwhile uh, spending the time on finding first a few of those uh, yeah super qualified senior people because they bring the experience that you need to build up a larger team. Uh, I would say in, in hindsight, maybe um, we were even growing too fast. So at the beginning we were growing like super fast. Um, I think from like five people to 30 in a very short period of time, then to 60. And this was maybe too fast. It takes a lot of time to onboard to, to Web3 and uh, uh, maybe we should have like, uh, been slower so there was also quite some fluctuation <laughs> for some time um, but I would say since maybe one year or so has been pretty constant and uh, people that work at Gnosis work there for a very long time uh, I think definitely above the average in the industry so I think many have been working with us for like four years or more uh, which is a very long time of course in crypto <laughs> and I think the reason why they do this is because we uh yeah, we have a very open culture. Um, like we, we, we don't, we, we don't, we, for a long time, we did not impose hierarchies, but rather we saw like how, how qualified people are. And then naturally they kind of stepped up into leadership positions. Um, and yeah, and I think we, we also tried to align incentives. Of course, we had a Gnosis token program, <laughs> which I guess also helped a little bit, even though I think there was also a lot of improvement possible. Um, but yeah, I think, I think this was kind of the mix that, uh, made us succeed. Of course, we also, again, like, especially at the beginning had pretty high fluctuation and, uh, especially of course, also in a bear market, it's sometimes difficult for, for everyone to see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> um, but I guess this has changed and now it's, I guess, easier, like now it's more like, I guess a problem that. Uh, like talent is very scarce and many people will approach you even if you are already hired by someone <laughs> and uh, then it's I guess more about being competitive and um, 
yeah, I think for for like very important positions for me, it's of course very important that the incentives are very aligned. So in this case, we will try to give a large part of the compensation in token itself, which are vested. Um, with like other positions, I think it's fine to to just ask people what they want, uh, because many will just not care about this anyways, and they rather have a higher salary. And I think then it's better to actually give them what they want. Uh, so try to make people happy. And it's the easiest way to do it is just ask them what makes them happy. Uh, we, we made many assumptions. Um, we had a token program for everyone. And in hindsight, I think it was a mistake uh, simply because some people just didn't appreciate it. And we gave them lots of tokens, like no matter in what position you were in, and uh, yeah, but they didn't really care. They didn't, they saw it more like, oh, that's a bonus, but that's not really even related to my work. I think it was also an issue at Nose is that the GNO token price for a long time was just correlating to the Ether reserves that we had and was not really correlating to the achievements that people in the company did. And so it always felt kind of, felt kind of weird um, to, to have these tokens. And um, yeah, so one advice would be uh, to keep people and to make them happy, ask them what they want. Of course, also with their compensation, how the compensation is constructed. Um, and yeah, have a good work culture. Make, like in, in case of Gnosis, this is like uh, hierarchies don't matter. Like your knowledge or expertise matters. <laughs> um, and the best idea wins. Like it's not my idea that wins, but if my employees have a better idea than I do, then yeah, it's fine. We go with this one. Uh, and uh, we have a very honest discussion about this. And um, yeah, I think this is what, what people at Gnosis appreciate. Awesome. Let's look at other questions. Uh, let us go for, well, okay, this is quite nice. Outside of the Gnosis ecosystem, and maybe even outside of the consensus ecosystem, favorite project you've seen recently? Ooh. Or thing? I so many. Um, I mean, I'm generally... Uh, quite excited to see all the innovation in the DAO space simply because I see DAOs as being uh, one of the um, yeah, main innovation drivers. So I see like there's a big uh, growing industry and <clears throat> was very excited to see, for example, the Assange DAO, where for the first time, um, yeah, we have this sort of crowdfunding, which was very successful, <coughs> which also has like this polit political angle. And so I think we will see a lot more uh, coordination and so, yeah, I'm very, yeah, very excited for all kind of experiments happening in the space. Um, and uh, yeah, there are projects like uh, like Orca, for example, that tries to to find out how yeah how these structures can be replicated. Um, that we maybe know also from more let's say traditional companies, <laughs> like having subdivisions. Like obviously, right now the issue is that uh, for most DAOs, we try to solve everything. Uh, in one snapshot or like in one vote and everyone can vote but this is not really scalable and uh, obviously not everyone is uh, should be entitled to to vote on everything maybe uh, depending on what the expertise is and so they are experimenting on how how this can be structured such that DAOs can become much more scalable and I, I hope really that we will see yeah massive DAOs going forward where maybe really like hundreds of thousands of people maybe a city is is kind of its own DAO and we find better ways how we can uh, decide on things because um, well, that's where I see the beauty of DAOs is that we can much faster iterate on how, how we want to collaborate. And we, yeah, we are not like bound to the structures that we have set up outside of, of blockchain, uh, how we decide on things. And uh, I mean, whenever I interact with, with the government or whenever I see how some decisions are made, I feel like, uh, maybe it would be better to have different structures that would allow different ways to, to decide. And yeah, I see there's huge innovation potential. Um, yeah, just thinking of there's like, I mean, there's so many applications that, yeah, I mean, um, there's lots if of- I'm, If I may yeah, interrupt. I would say, yeah, there's one more. Sorry, this, yeah, go for sorry, it, go for one it. More. Yeah. So generally, I'm super excited whenever we bridge the gap from crypto for crypto to crypto for outside crypto, because I feel we really have hit the ceiling um, in terms of crypto to crypto innovation. Like, of course, there are new DeFi protocols, but I think we've figured out the basics. 
And uh, I am really excited to understand how we can uh, allow more people to benefit from what we created in crypto. One example is uh, VitaDAO. So um, it is a DAO which uh, allows to use yeah, blockchain for capital formation to fund uh, longevity research. So it's a combination of bringing the science community to blockchain and benefit um, from what blockchain can enable, specifically about uh, funding uh, new ideas, new startups, and um, also allowing the value capture on blockchain. So I think that has huge potential and I would love to see yeah, to see more like uh, decentralized science DAOs in all kinds of variations, uh, especially also because uh, science is something that's, especially like foundational research is something that's always underfunded. And it's kind of a pity for me that uh, the smartest brains are working on the next clone of whatever, <laughs> just to make money uh, instead of trying to really solve fundamental issues, which can potentially yeah, help humanity. <laughs> Not saying that it's bad to build like another V5 product. Uh, of course, there's still innovation possible, but I feel in terms of where brain power is allocated and what we potentially actually need, there's still a mismatch. And um, yeah, I hope that with blockchain, we will be able to reallocate resources a bit better. Perfect. I have a question, but it's actually we're out of time. So I might ask you privately. <laughs> anyway, uh, Stefan, that was fantastic. Uh, and again, I think uh, I hadn't realized that the new measure of a good AMA is how many questions unanswered that you want to ask that we haven't got time for, rather than like, uh, yeah, I've got so many. So thank you so much, first and foremost, for your insight and, and uh, some really thoughtful answers, uh, quite frankly. I can't wait for the transcript because it's stuff I want to reread myself. Um, and thank you everyone for coming at this event today. This was recorded, uh, will be put on YouTube. Uh, and as I say, there's a lovely transcript that will come where we try and capture your voice properly. Uh, so uh, to do justice, some great answers. But, but thank you in the meantime, Stefan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. It was also my pleasure. And yeah, thank you all for joining and asking questions. Um, happy to answer more if you have outside of this <laughs> interview. Uh, okay, yeah. Perfect. Cool. Uh, it's been a pleasure, guys. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening, Stefan. Once again, enjoy the the what I'm sure is a slightly sunny evening in uh, in Lisbon. But, uh, see you all. See you all soon, and and see you in the Encode event, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.